So tonight, inshallah, we're going to do the tafsir of Surah number 94, Surah al Inshirah. This is an early Meccan surah. Uh, it's, according to the ulama, it's the 12th surah that was revealed upon the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, it proceeds, Wabduha, that's number 11, Wabduha. And then you have an Inshirah, which is also called a Sharh. <coughs> we'll talk about the meanings of these different names. And then Wal Asr is number 13, the proceed after this surah. So Wabduha, Inshirah, and then Wal Asr. If you look at the structure of the surah, very interesting. Some of these uh, chapters in Juz Amma, in the last 30th of the Quran, have a ring structure. So there's eight uh, verses. Um, in the surah. So the first four, we have four rhetorical questions. Istifham taqreer. Istifham taqreer. Rhetorical questions. We'll talk about what this means. But basically what we have here are reminders. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet وسلم, of blessings with respect to the past. Okay, four uh, rhetorical questions uh, denoting, uh, reminding the Prophet وسلم, of blessings from the past. Uh, the last two are uh, two commands to the Prophet وسلم, and by extension to all of us, because every command to the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran is also a command to his ummah, unless it's stated explicitly according to Imam Shafi'i that it's only to the Prophet. وسلم. So these commands are with respect to the future. So then in the middle then, verses 5 and 6, this is seen as the focus. So this A corresponds with this A. And then between them you have this focus. This is called a chiasmus in Greek. Or chiastic structure. It's very common in the Quran. Uh, Western scholars like Paul Ernst and Michelle Kuyper, they've studied the Quran in detail. Even the longer surahs have this sort of structure. Uh, there's a book called The Banquet, if you're interested, The Banquet, by a man named Michelle Kuyper, which he says all of surah at Ma'ida is one big chiasm. In other words, the beginning, the beginning of the surah is similar to the end of the surah. There's a, there's a correlation. The second part of Al Ma'ida is similar to the uh, the, the last, the, the second to last part of the surah, and so on and so forth, until you get to a focus in the surah. So you have to remember now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This surah is 120 some odd ayat, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not writing down the surah, and it's being revealed to him over a few years. So it's virtually impossible for somebody to keep track of this chiasmus just sort of orally over a few years. And it's possible, but extremely, extremely difficult to do that. He actually won an award uh, by the government of Iran gave him an award for this book called The Banquet. And according to Karl Ernst, in fact, all of Al-Baqarah is one big ring structure also. The entire Surah Baqarah. Right? Because the Surah is a literary unit. It's not uh, a bunch of verses that don't relate to one another. There's a correlation in the Surah itself. Does everyone have to understand what's going on here? The focus here is in the middle. Right? So you have four rhetorical questions. Then you have, in the middle, you have a focus, which is a promise. And then you have two commands. So essentially, in the surah, it's, didn't I do this? Therefore, I promise this, so do this. Right? Didn't I do this? Therefore, I promise this, so do this. That's essentially what the surah is saying. <clears throat> so this is part of a group of surahs that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the early Meccan period that act as consolation for him. So things are going uh, badly uh, for him, ﷺ. there's a lot of rejection, there's a lot of persecution of the early Muslims. So this surah is considered one of the so-called surahs of consolation. To console him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, just like the surah that came before it, surah number ninety-three, or Buha, is included in this group. Also, surah al-Masad, also called Abi Lahab, surah one eleven, and all of these surahs cu uh, culminate in surah one o eight, 
Al-Kawthar. Inna a'atina kal kawthar. Right? And it's very interesting, this surah, Kawthar is also a, a chiasmus. It has a ring structure. Because the opposite of Kawthar is Abtar. Right? The end, the last word in the first verse is Kawthar. The last word of the third verse is Abtar. These correlate. So then the focus of the surah is in the middle. Fasalli bi rabbika wanha. Right? To worship your Lord and sacrifice for his sake. This is the focus of the surah. If this, I mean, this is, this is a theory, right, that these surahs of the Quran have this sort of structure, but it's uh, pretty popular amongst Western academics nowadays. Um, um, so, there's different names of this surah. Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al-Tibmadi in the Sunnah, they, they simply called it Surah Alam Nashrah Lak. Alam Nashrah Lak. Uh, other ulama, they call it Asharh. Asharh. And yet other ulama call it Al Inshirah. What is Sharh? It means to expound upon something, to explain something, or to widen, to dilate something. And okay, we'll talk more about what this means, inshallah ta'ala. Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would recite Waduha and Al Inshirah in one rak'ah. So there's a correlation, there's a relationship between these two surahs. Ibn Abbas actually said that this surah is a continuation of the last surah. Fakhradi al Razi, in his tafsir, he has something called Al Munasabat, where he actually shows the relationship between the surahs. Right? Why this surah comes after this surah? Why does it precede this one? What is the relationship actually between the surahs? So within a surah, those coherence. Right? There's a structure within the surah and then between the surahs. Inter surah, intra surah. Right? <clears throat> um, now, this surah and the one before it, Wabuha, are uh, specifically, exclusively addressed to the Prophet. So if you look at the text of the surah, and I hope everyone has a mushaf or can follow along. Um, Inshallah, maybe on your phone or something. And maybe, you know, take a few notes. Doesn't hurt. Especially for the Shabbat, if you're from the youth. You might be the MSA president one day. Or you might, uh, you know, might give a khutbah. Who knows? Allah Ma'alim one day. And then, uh, you know, maybe you have great memories. I don't know. Ibrahim al Nakhari, you would never write anything down. Imam Shafi would rarely write things down. He would sort of write it on his hand with his finger. That's how he was sort of. There's nothing to look at later, but these people were geniuses. So we should write things down because, inshallah ta'ala, the point here is increasing our knowledge. So the surah begins, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. In this a, alam, a, right? This is called Hamza tu taqreer. Hamza tu taqreer. This is used for a rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? What is the difference between a rhetorical question and a regular question? Does anyone know? Can I do the question and yes and no answer? Very good. She's an Arabic student. <laughs> <laughs> a regular question has a yes or no answer. There's a definite answer. And usually in Arabic, how does that question begin? Hal. Hal. Very another Arabic student. Hal. Hal ataka hadith al ghashiyah. Right? Has the story of the ghashiyah, the overwhelming event, has it reached you? So the question, the answer is either na'am or la. Right? If there's had, there's a definite sabla. Yeah. Okay. Brother was nice enough to bring us some masahif. If you want to grab one and follow along, inshallah ta'ala, that'd be great. Uh, but here we have a, ah, right? So then what is the purpose of a rhetorical question? Istifham taqreer. What is the purpose of it? The purpose is to remind someone of something that's already established. Taqreer means established. Right? Qarra from the verb qarra to establish something. The purpose is not for you to get an answer from the person. It's a very effective way of reminding the person of something. Right? For example, if we go out to lunch with my kids, and an hour later they say, we're hungry. I say, didn't we just eat? Right? I'm not, asking, I'm not, I'm not looking for a yes or no, because I already know. And they already know. Right? So it reminds them, oh yeah, we should have we asked it. Right? Or some, if I beat somebody in one-on-one -on -one basketball, 
And then the next day I see him and he's talking trash to everyone. I'm the best basketball player. I said, didn't I beat you yesterday? Oh, congrats. Okay. So this is called a rhetorical question. Istifham taqreer. So when you say alam, when you see that in the Quran, alam, this is indicating istifham taqreer, a, a rhetorical question. It's going to get your uh, attention. It wants to remind you of something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa about a past blessing using this rhetorical device of an istifham taqreer. Okay? And he says, alam nashrah. Nashrah, present active, just in its mood. That's for the Arabic students. Don't worry about it. We can all try to study some Arabic, by the way. Uh, nashrah, right? This begins with a noon. What does that mean? We. This is first person common plural. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He didn't say, Adam ashrah. Right? He didn't say, didn't I? He says, did it we? We. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use a we? We talked about this last week a little bit. This noon is called noon at ta'adhim. According to Ibn Hisham. Noon at ta'adhim is Jemr and Medici. It's a royal plural. The royal plural, this happens in many languages, even in Western languages, primarily in Semitic languages. Like the very first verse of the Torah is in Hebrew, Barashith bara Elohim et Hashemayim. In the beginning, God's plural created the heavens and the earth. Right? But no rabbi would ever say, oh, that's because there's more than one God. No, they believe in Torah. But some of the Christians, on the other hand, when they look at this verse, <laughs> they say things that are ajib and gharib. Because they don't understand that this is a, a, a nuance in Semitic languages. So, alam nashrah. And the ulama say here, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the nuru ta'adim, this denotes his greatness and majesty. But also denotes the greatness and majesty of the one he's addressing, the addressee. Right? That the addressee has ta'adim and tashrif uh, and takrim. And who is he addressing? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And also the ulama mentioned, just as an FYI for the note takers, that when you make dua, even if you're by yourself, you should pluralize them. Make your dua plural. So, subhanaka in inna kunna min al If you know how to do it. If you don't know Arabic, then stick to what you know. But pluralize them. Fa'afu anna instead of fa'afu anni. Right? Include in your attention the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just as a side note for you. So, Adam Nashrah. Did we not Nashrah from Sharhun? So this this word Sharh, this is the Masta, the infinitive. It means to explain something, to open up the meanings of a complex issue, to clarify something. So if you read, for example, I studied the Matan of the Ajrumiya, you studied the Alfiya, these are books, treatises of Arabic grammar. They'll say, which sharh, which uh, commentary did you study with it, right? So this is something that clarifies things that are complex. Uh, so throughout history, the ulama would write texts uh, by distilling them. They would write mukhtasar, of a mukhtasar, of a mukhtasar, an abridgment of an abridgment of an abridgment, because they would assume that you're studying the text with a teacher, right, who could explain to you uh, the background of the text and certain meanings of the text, things like that. Uh, they would assume that you uh, would receive a sharh, an explanation, a commentary of a, any particular text that you're studying. So sharaha is a transitive verb. Sharaha. Does anyone know what a transitive verb means? It's called al-fir muta'addi in Arabic. Anyone who knows that what that means? Somebody new? I know this one. What? What is it? You know? Yes. So, fiqh muta'addi means you need to have an object. You need a direct object. For example, if I said, I slapped, and then I stopped, what would be your question? Who did you slap? Probably a bad example, right? <laughs> who did you slap? Right? Because why? To slap in English is a transitive verb. You need a what? A direct object. Or if I say I brought, 
what, what did you bring? I brought. What did you bring? I brought the uh, church eye. Do fucking time? Dude, I have a joke. What did the cereal say to the milk? What's up, dude? That's an Ordu joke, buddy. Those who know Ordu are, are laughing hard. Anyway, so the Ulama say here that not only the Prophet received the message, but, but was given the greatest openings of its meanings. Okay? So the Prophet is receiving the Quran upon his heart, but he's also having his sadr expanded with its meanings. He's receiving the Quran and he's the authority of the Quran in explaining the Quran. This is what the Ulama says. Imam Suyuti says, bin nubuwati wa ghayriha. Explaining his nubuwa, his prophecy, and other things as well. Yes, sir. And a quick question. So this, that surah, the, the verse does not mean, it's not related to the Isra and what happened with the story of him going to, uh, yeah. to would you read about mm -hmm. in your chest and all that? Yeah, we're going to we're talk about that, inshallah. Even Kathir does mention that. He does mention it. Some of the other ones mentioned it. We'll talk more about that in a minute, inshallah ta'ala. So, alam <clears throat> nashrah. So, the usual tartib, the word order in Arabic is fi'il, fa'il, and maf'ul. You have the, the verb, then you have the subject, then you have the direct object after the verb. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say, alam nashrah sadraka lak. That's the kind of normal word order. That the prepositional phrase, the jar majrur, should come at the end. That's kind of standard, modern standard Arabic. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, however, he brings the prepositional phrase forward, muqaddam, laka, sadrak, and he delays the mafrubi, he delays the uh, direct object. We'll talk about that. So, laka, alam nashrah, did we not expand, did we not dilate, did we not uh, explain laka for you? Laka means for you. And the ulama say here, this lamb is called lamu ta'adil, the lamb of purpose, right? For you, because of you, for your sake. Did we not explain for your sake? This is a better translation. Uh, I brought two translations here in English. One is the famous Yusuf Ali, and there's a new one here, Ahmad Zahi Hamad, who's an Asmari scholar. It's a very good translation if you're interested. It's called The Glorious Quran by Dr. Ahmad Zahi Hamad scholar at Al-Azhar University. And I forgot to mention last time as well, there's a beautiful tafsir of the Qur'an that's been totally translated into a beautiful translation uh, by, the original was done by Mulana Mufti Muhammad al-Shafi'i. Uh, he's uh, from Pakistan. It was published at uh, Dar al-Ulum. Um, it's called Ma'arif al-Qur'an. Ma'arif al-Qur'an. You can actually find it online. It's eight volumes. The entire Hard copy, if you will, is in Sabarmul Masjid. You want to look at it, but don't remove books from the Masjid. Okay, you can just look at it. Put it back, take notes. Hey, make a photocopy. Don't tell people, please. Copy right for the news. Ma'ari from the Quran, if you're interested in the very good English translation of a tafsir. Anyway, so what does this mean then? What, what is the significance of bringing laka before the object? The prepositional phrase before the uh, direct object is that it's more personal. It's more personal. It denotes qurb and mahabba, nearness, proximity of the Prophet to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the significance of it. It denotes the maqam of the Prophet. It also, uh, according to the ulama, it creates shawq or tashwiq in the listener. What is tashwiq? Anticipation or longing or suspense for the direct object. This is why we should recite the Quran slowly. Right? The Prophet would recite the Quran slowly, in a rush. The point isn't to get to the end. So people think, we have to do five khatam of Quran during Ramadan, so we're going to, oh, what do you recite? Is that the Torah? Is it the New Testament? I can't even understand what you're saying. What's the point of that? 
Because when you listen, Alam Nashrah Laka, it's building anticipation. What? What was expanded for you? What was it? And then Sadrak. And then you say, ah, that's the point of the structure, is to create this tashwiq. Like, like one of my teachers said, it's like smelling the food, but you don't know where it is. It hasn't come out yet. Right? You're in a restaurant and you're hungry, and you're smelling, ah, biryani, abri palavas, whatever. <laughs> Pizza, and then you, you're smelling it, you're starving, but you don't see it. So you have that hunger. This is called tashwil, right? Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Right? So this is the climax of the ayah. So this is called ibalatu, ibalatu zikril mafrul, the laying, the mention of the direct object. Very common in the Quran. Ibalatu zikril mafrul, the laying, the mention of the object. Right. It's a rhetorical device in Balaha. Balaha means rhetoric, advanced Arabic. Right? Quite common in the Quran. The other reason for doing this is for ikhtisas, to denote exclusivity, that this is only for you, alam nashrah laka sadrak. Did we not expand for you only your sadr, your chest? Right? So this is called ikhtisas. Only for you and in a unique way. Because this expansion of the Sadr is mentioned in other places in the Quran, but not like this, not in this type of special or exclusive way. So Alam Nashrah Laka Sadra. Now, the question was is this a reference to the chest splitting of the Prophet and the washing of his heart? This happened two or three times. Some of the early must say happened four times, right? We know it definitely happened twice, because remember when we have uh, hadith that seem to contradict, the ulama try to make what? What is it called? You have two hadith that are sound hadith, and you have to make them work. You have to harmonize them. This is called al-jama'ah. Al-jama'ah. Right? So they say this happened at least twice in his life. Once when he was a child, when he, when he was with the Bani Sa'ad, and the men came and split his chest, and they took out the Habdu Shaytan that we talked about. And again, just before the uh, Isra, later to Isra, uh, his heart was washed. Some of the exegetes do mention this. Uh, Qadi Abu Bakr uh, bin Arabi and Imam al Alusi uh, say that this is not a reference to that. And this is the dominant opinion. That this uh, Sharh of the Sadr is not the same as the Shaq of the Sadr. They're two different things. Right? This Sharh. This expansion is not the shock, is not the splitting. They're two different things. They say it's incorrect to correlate the expansion of the chest with the splitting of the chest. So this is not a, a, an expansion or splitting, if you will, that is haqiqi, it's not literal, it's majaz. Uh, it's figurative. Okay? This is the dominant opinion. But some of the ulama do mention uh, that one of the meanings could be the actual physical haqiqi splitting of the chest of the Prophet Ibn Kathir mentions it and other uh, exegetes as well. Wallahu Now interesting here, there's iltifat. What is iltifat? Another rhetorical device, which literally means sudden change. Sudden change in uh, person or sudden change in tense. Quite common in the Quran. Very confusing for people who don't know Arabic very well, like the classical orientalists who know, you know intermediate Arabic at best. So they can translate the Quran, but then they say, why is this plural here and singular here, and why is this first person, and then we have third person, they don't understand this iti fact. But someone who's familiar with Arabic poetry uh, will understand the purpose of that. So in surah, the previous surah, which again is linked to this surah, according to Ibn Mas'ud, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking in the third person to the Prophet sallallahu Right? Your Lord. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking third person to the Prophet. But here in this surah, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadra. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking in what person? First person. Have we not expanded for you? Have we not expanded because of you your chest? Right? So again, this denotes closeness to the Prophet 
Of course, if you're familiar with other places in the Quran, there's a verse in Surah Taha, ayah number 25, when Musa alayhi salam was at the uh, Shajara, what was his famous dua? Rabbi Shrahli Sadri. Right? Rabbi Shrahli Sadri. It's usually translated as, My Lord, expand for me my chest. What does that mean? According to the ulama, give me openings in this affair, increase me in meanings. Increase me in meanings so that I may have comfort or certitude or courage. So the ulama mentioned here, Musa alayhi salam, he had a talab, he had a request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him this uh, type of openings, these meanings, or as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bila talab, without any type of request from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him. There's another verse in the Quran in Surah An'am, Surah number 6, ayah number 125, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَيَّهْدِيَهُ نَشْرَحْ يَأْيَدْ نَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ You can look up the ayah. Uh, that if Allah wants uh, to guide somebody, if Allah wants to guide somebody, He will expand His chest with Islam. Right? So Imam Tustari, he says, based on this ayah, in Surah An'am, ayah number 125. And this Surah, an Inshirah, he says there's actually Shahrain. There's two types. There's two types of expansion of the chest. The first is when someone first becomes Muslim. Right? When somebody first becomes Muslim, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expand that person's chest and give that person Islam. The second type of Shah, according to Imam study, is this Muslim. Uh, during his progression or her progression is given certain divine histories and uh, climbs levels, ahwal and maqamat and manazil, the purpose of which is to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to increase in love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ulama mentioned also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, Alam nashrah laka qalbak. Did we not expand for you your heart, your qalb? It says sadr. What is the difference? They say because the qalb actually receives the Qur'an while the sadr understands the meanings of the Qur'an. Allahu alam. The qalb is actually receiving the Qur'an while the sadr, the chest, as it were, is understanding the meanings of the Qur'an. The sadr must be expanded because the Qur'an is weighty. The Qur'an is Weighty. We will reveal unto you a weighty word. If this Quran was revealed upon a mountain, you would have seen it crumble. Right? The Quran is weighty. So the Prophet his sadr had to be expanded. Um, there's a verse in Surah Hud. فَاسْتَقِمْ كَمَا أُمِرْتْ Which means, have istiqama, be upright as you are commanded, as you have been commanded. The Prophet ﷺ said, this verse turned some of my beard hair gray. It's a, it's a very weighty verse. Surah Hud wa akhawatuha, he said. Hud and its sister surahs are very, were, 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 well, I'm getting my D's and W's mixed up here. Minnesota Vikings. Were very weighty on the Prophet ﷺ. They actually turned his hair. He didn't have a lot of gray hair, by the way. A few. Ibn Umar said I counted 17 on his temples. Not like me. I'm basically 90%. Chemical imbalance, right? But his constitution is perfect. So even in his 60s, just a few gray hair. And they actually went in there and one, two, three. Ibn Omar is looking at five, six, seven. This is how much detail they wanted to know about the Prophet. Okay, so meanings were given to the Prophet in order to understand the revelation. No human being understands the Quran better than the Prophet. The Quran revealed upon his heart, but explained upon his sadr. The meanings were open for, of the Quran for the Prophet. And when you know the meanings of things, you have confidence, you have certitude. Right? Like when I was a kid, I did this book report, I didn't read the book. I just kind of read the back of the book, 
And I went up there, and I didn't know what I was saying, but I sort of summarized the back. So it seemed like I know what I was doing, right? Like what I'm doing right the back of the book, right? Uh, and then the teacher said, well, what, what, what do you, can you elaborate on this? I was like in third grade. Uh, it was very embarrassing. But if I knew more about the book, if I had more insight to the meanings of certain things, then it increases your courage, your certitude, right? You have confidence. So this is the meaning of the dua of Musa alayhi In other words, give me meanings of what I'm doing so that I can increase in my confidence. Because he has to go to the most powerful man on earth at the time. The <clears throat> Okay? So that's verse 1. And I'm nashrah laka sadra. Any questions on verse 1? Verse 1 to the long Let's go to verse 2. Wa wada'ana anka wisrak. Wada'an. So again, wa wada'ana. Right? Gunu ta'zim. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the royal plural. And wada'a ala means to put on something. Wada'a an means to remove something. Right? To remove. And alam, it still applies here. This is part of the it's a rhetorical question, interrogatives. Right? Did we not expand for you your chest? And in parentheses, did we not remove from you your wisdom? Your burden, right? We'll talk about this, inshallah. And this verse is actually grammatically connected to verse number three. You can actually think of two and three as being almost the same verse, but it doesn't matter if they split it out, no problem. The verse numbers actually came much later um, in history. Um, so what is this wisdom? Did we not remove from you this your burden? So a wisdom is a hamal shadid, a great burden, a great weight. The difference between a wisdom and a hamal. Hamal is something that can be carried, from hamala, to carry. But a wisdom is something that is just about to break you. You, you can barely carry it to the point where it's going to crush you. This is called the wisdom. And in the Quran also, wisdom is used synonymously for sin, a sin. Right? That no one can bear the sins of another person. No one can bear the burdens. In this context, the sins of another person. And then we have al qaba We'll talk more about how this relates to the Prophet ﷺ. Is the Prophet capable of sinning? What about before the bi'na? What does that actually mean? What does that entail? We'll talk about that, inshallah ta'ala. And then we have al qaba This is from naqaba, which means to break, to destroy, or to abolish. Like to break a contract, to break a bone. This is a causative form, form four in Arabic, al qaba which means to crack in the qab. So it's a very graphic um, uh, metaphor. If I stack bricks on this table, right, and the table starts to what? Make this sound. Cracking, I can't make it the plastic table. So it starts to crack, this is called in the Cracking because of a weight upon it, right? Or if I do this with my fingers, if you don't like this, you can plug your ears. Okay. There you go. Which you shouldn't do, by the way. By the way, doing this is makru in the prayer, just to let you know. People do it all the time, including myself. There are people who get up and have to, they have to every single time after the sun's ready to crack their knees. And then start to so try to resist the urge. I'm speaking primarily to myself. This is called inqal, cracking. So imagine something on your back. That's weighing you down so much that you can hear your back cracking and you're just about to fall. You're just, just about to fall. This is the image that's given here in, in the Quran. So this is called Majaz Akli. It's Majaz Akli, which is a metaphor. Because what is a wisdom? Can a wisdom physically do that to someone's back? No, because a wisdom is not something tangible. It's not concrete, right? So the point here is to demonstrate the burden of the Prophet ﷺ was really weighty. When he first received the revelation, it was weighty upon him, sallallahu to the point, how can he describe the weightiness of the message? The burden of the da'wah. How can you put it into a metaphor? Imagine your bricks on your back, and your back is cracking, and you're about to fall. This is how he felt, sallallahu alayhi wa Okay. 
So then what is this wisdom? What is the burden? So the other must say, this is a burden that is caused for a need for answers. A need for answers. He was searching. Remember, this surah again is, re is related to the previous surah of Duha. And you were galan. This does not mean hashalillah that the Prophet was astray or he was worshipping idols or because well, it's related to that. But that's not what it means according to the ulama, according to the ijma of the uh, exegetes. Ba'lan here means that he was searching for something. He's searching for something. Okay? So he's searching for answers. And this greatly weighed him down to the point where he lost interest in the tijara. He lost interest in business. He would go to the jabal, right? For days on end, he was deeply contemplative in his nature. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Deeply contemplative. If you saw the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his solitude, you would think he was. It says that you would think that he was grieving, but he was just deeply contemplative. Right? People don't think anymore. They have to plug into something. But he was like that. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A lot of tafkir, right? A lot of tadabbur of things. This is how he was before the birata, before the revelation actually came to him. But he has no answers. So this was seen as a great burden upon him. Someone who is so inquisitive, someone who wants to help people, someone who is so compassionate but doesn't know how to go about doing it. How does he do it? It was a great burden upon him. Almost broke his back. So this is one of the meanings of wisdom. A great burden. A need for theological truth. A need for theological answers. So he needs guidance theologically, but also he has a desire for social reform. Social reform, right? How much did the oppression of women uh, hurt him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because he says he loves women, and he doesn't mean anything sensual about it. Something licentious in that statement. He loves the feminine attributes that he had himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or the very Wa'atul Banat. You know, killing children. How much did this affect him? So the Lord Almighty had him said, right? This was a wisdom on his back. Also, the relief of revelation after the fatra that we talked about. Oh, we didn't talk about the surah. This was a family night or something. We did a tafsir of al-duha, and the revelation stopped. And uh, Imam Suyuti says, "Hamsat ashar yom." That this stopped for 15 days. And the mushrikeen were making fun of the Prophet sallallahu and they said, Inna Rabbahu wa qalahu. Verily, his Lord has forsaken him and is angry with him. Right? So this, uh, these types of insults affected him greatly, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was like a wisdom on his back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّهُ Surah Hijr. Verily, we know that what they say constricts your heart. Right? The tafsir is that his words were affecting him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa a'rid anil jahilin. Remember, we talked about this verse last week. This explains what? Wa innaka la'ala kurubin azim. Remember the first level of tafsir? The riwayah. Right? Tafsir by transmission. The best type of transmission is Quran. Tafsir of the Quran, bil Quran, with the Quran. What does wa innaka la'ala kurubin azim mean? It means that verse. Khud al Afwa. Wa amur bil urf wa a'rid an al jahilin. Hold tightly to forgiveness, order towards the good, and don't worry about these jahilin. Don't let them affect you. Right? These people who say stupid things, these people who are ignorant, jahilin means ignorant people. They're trying to hurt you. Just turn away from them, don't worry about it. Because it affected the Prophet. Because he had great concern for people. The more concern you have for people, the more they rebel against you, the more it's going to hurt you. Right? If you don't care about people, you don't care what they do, you, you don't you don't care how they how they react to you. I don't care. Right? But if he has concern and love for people, which he did, you cannot guide all those whom you love. Allah's telling him, you can't do that. Right? So this is an aspect of the wisdom that there was uh, a burden on his back because his people are making fun of him because of the break in the revelation. <clears throat> and finally, the burden of guidance for all of humanity. 
is upon him because he is the last messenger to the burden of da'wah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again consoles the messenger وسلم, that your job is to deliver the message. Okay? Your job is to deliver the message. And it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide. Laysa alayka mudahun. Walakin Allah yahdi man yasha. It is not upon you. It's not getting wajib. It's not wajib upon you to guide them. Allah guides who He will. Right? It's a consolation to the Prophet. Balif, ya ayyuhar Rasul, balif ma unzila ilayhim ir Rabbik. Notify, bring the message to the people. What has been revealed to you, that's what you have to tell the people. Right? I believe this is one of the, if you study theology, prophetology, nabuwa, there are four things that are wajib upon every prophet. One of them is tabliyum. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands a prophet to say something or do something, he has to do it. He cannot keep it back. It's called kitman. To keep something back is mustahil. It's impossible for a prophet to do. Bandit. <clears throat> That's his job. That's his primary vocation is to give tabliyum of the Quran and explain the Quran. And if they don't believe, don't let that hurt you. But it did hurt him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has such a compassionate heart. Right? What is the person? Yes, you're almost killing yourself with grief over them. Allah says in the Quran. I have to review it. Age, getting older. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah that you're you're almost killing yourself with grief because of their rejection of the of the message. This is how much concern he had. So Allah wa'ala. The ulama also mentioned something interesting. They say also part of the wisdom, or we'll start we're still talking about this one word. What is this wisdom? What is this burden? They say also the burden or the thought of his minor sins before the Pirtha bothered him. And these are not sins as we know them. Remember, according to the Jumhur of the ulama, the Prophet uh, is incapable of, of performing any type of major sin, or what would be a major sin, even though there's no sharia, uh, because he is establishing a reputation. Right? He has pre-prophetic miracles called Irhas. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, appeals to his character before the bi'atha. Right? فَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ قُرُونَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ Right? Say to them, I have lived an entire lifetime before this. In other words, look at my reputation. I don't do these things. I've never done these things. And I was a sadiq al Right? So, the nature of, this, of a sin of the Prophet sallallahu is a sin in the maqam. The higher a person has in a station with God, the more is expected of that person. So it becomes as if it's a sin. The more knowledge you have, the more is expected of you. Right? So if you, have, so, you know, I know some brothers that are going through major tribulation, major tribulation, like I've never seen type of tribulation. And they've been, they're, they memorize the Quran and they pray to Hajjud every night. Right? And then they stop doing that. They stop reviewing the Quran. They stop praying to Hajj. So why is this all happening to me? Because more is expected from you. Right? So the ulama say, Hasanatul Abrar, Sayyatul Muqarradin. The good deeds of the righteous are the sins of the most righteous. So a sin in the maqam. Right? So, for example, some of the ulama say that it's a sin for a prophet to do something mubah. What is mubah? Simply means permissible. It's not a sin and it's not virtuous. It's just permissible. Some of the ulama say it's impossible for a prophet to do something mubah because a prophet is expected always to be virtuous. If we do something mubah, we say alhamdulillah. Why? Because we're not doing something makru or haram, right? So that's good for us to do something mubah. But the ulama also say if you keep doing things that are permissible, they could add up the things, they can add up the waste of time. For example, you watch a halal TV show, and then you say, that's mubah, but then you watch another one, and another one, and another one, and oh, it's Oscar time, let's delay it a little bit. La you know, that becomes mubah, maybe haram, if you miss the prayer, right? 
So more is expected from the Prophet sallallahu The ulama also mentioned the sirah that one time the Prophet was a very young man. He heard some of the shabab having a party. He heard some music and there was probably drinking. And, uh, I don't think they were checking IDs back then. Uh, and you know, it's uh, frivolity and mixing of the genders. So he had curiosity. I want to see what's going on over there. He takes one step and he falls down. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want him exposed to anything like that. He was just curious, just want to see what's going on. Right? He said that I woke up and the sun was shining on my back. The sun woke me up. And he slept the whole night. He missed the entire thing, this little party that the Shabbat were having. Right? So things like this. Imam Sayyuti says, uh, in order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive your thumb from the past, your sins of the past. Remember, the sin of a prophet is different than our sins. The sin of a prophet, we mentioned this many times, again, if you study theology, the sin of a prophet is leaving an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. This is the sin of a prophet. Leave an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. What is our sin? Adultery, murder, we lie, we kill, right? That's, that's the sin of us. But the sin of a prophet, a dumb of a prophet, is leaving an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. The prophets are ma'asum. So then why does the Prophet ask forgiveness? He asks forgiveness, he says, 70 times a day. This primarily after the salah, after the prayer. Why? Because of his inability to praise Allah as he should be praised. This is why he's making tawbah. Because of his inability, he says, Subhanaka la mercy ala nafsi, which basically means that uh, glory be to you, how can I praise you as you have praised yourself? This is why he's making istighfar. Why does a man who's ma'asum say astaghfirullah? Because he's unable to praise Allah, he's unable to praise Allah as Allah praised himself. This is why he's making istighfar. Why do we make istighfar? To be lie and cheat, kill and riba all of these types of things. These things are impossible for prophets. Okay? And also, only the prophets of Allah sort of knew that all of his transgressions were completely forgiven. No other prophet knew this. This is why, according to the Hadith Shafa'a, when they go to different prophets, who are also ma'asum, they don't have a guarantee. There's a little bit of fear. Nafsi, nafsi. I don't know. Go to somebody else. Go to Isa, nafsi, nafsi. Ruh Allah. Nafsi, nafsi, ula Ahmad, in ana laha, this is what he said. I am for this. And he uh, intercedes. He has the maqam of mahmud, the station of the intercession. Also, the ulama mentioned something here. They say, wizrak also includes the sins of the ummah. The sins of the ummah. His ummah. Sinning bothered him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Because he was always thinking of the Ummah. Right? There's a connection, a special connection between the Prophet and his Ummah. He has a special connection with us, so we need to have a special connection with him. Right? When he said, for example, I wish I could have seen my brothers, the Sahaba said, oh, Aren't we your brothers? Yeah, but no, you're, he said, No, you're, you're my companions. Right? Who are my brothers? Those who come after me who haven't seen me. Right? He has that special connection with us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He consoles the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish them while you are amongst them. Allah will not punish them while they're making istighfar. So the Prophet is not amongst us, then we make istighfar. So the Prophet ﷺ was thinking about the Ummah uh, quite uh, regularly. The hadith of Aisha also indicates the Prophet ﷺ was re reciting all night until his feet were swollen. Uh, one ayah uh, from the end of Al Ma'idah, uh, If you forgive them, uh, they are your slaves. Uh, but if you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you punish them, then you're slaves. But if you forgive them, you are great and wise. This one ayah, he would repeat the entire night. And then she said he collapsed in the sajda and said, Ummati, Ummati. 
This is how he's thinking about his own life. The whole night thinking about you and me. Right? So he has that special connection. So thinking about the sins of his ummah was a burden on his back. And of course, you have the one hadith, and there's weakness in the hadith. Uh, in the it's in the uh, uh, in the hadith of uh, the the tafsir of Samarqandi, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he uh, beyond the sitrat al muntaha, he says that tahiyat al dilahi was salawat wa tayyibat. Right, this is what we say obviously in the prayer. Allah responds, Assalamu alaikum ayyuh al nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's the next line? Salamu alayna. Who's na? The ummah. This is the Prophet's response to what Allah says. Peace be upon us and the righteous servants of God. So alayna, the Sahaba. Wa ibadullah salihin, the rest of the ummah. According to the muhaddithin of this hadith. There is some weakness in the hadith, but the ulama generally will quote the hadith uh, as being true in its meaning. Okay? So, Part of the wisdom then being taken off his back is a shafa'a, the intercession, the shafa'a. And again, this goes back to the previous surah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the previous surah, وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Soon will your Lord gift you something. يُعْتَى Right? There's a difference between وَعَبَى and آتَى and أَعْتَى They all mean to give. But there's subtle differences. You are a tika, I mean you give something to someone because they deserve it. They have they have some uh, meritorious quality, and you can never take it back. It's a gift. This is you because you deserve this is yours because you deserve it. Immediately you'll be pleased. And according to Imam Suyuti, when this verse was revealed to the Prophet, he said, I will never be pleased. While well, one person's my ummah is in the fire. Okay. So the meaning of the ayah then, according to the ulama, is what is this thing? What is this thing that Allah will give the Prophet? The shafa'a. The shafa'a. So this carries into the next surah. Part of this wisdom that almost broke his back, sallallahu alayhi wa is thinking about the sins of the ummah. That eventually there will be a shafa'a of the Prophet. We have to move quickly. I think we're out of time. Do we have to stop now? Can we go a few more minutes? Yes, Okay, well, we're going to have to move quickly. Uh, so we mentioned that. Uh, and, did we, and did we not remove your burden, which was breaking your back? Breaking your back. Again, Majan. Aqli, this is a metaphor uh, to demonstrate how uh, burdensome this wisdom actually was for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can write a volume on this verse. Uh, Imam al-Tabari, Ibn Kathir, and Imam al-Alusi, they, mentioned, they all mention the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu alayhi which Jibreel alayhi salam gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. It says, your Lord says, do you know how I elevated your mention? Do you know how I elevated your mention? And the Prophet said, Allahu A'lam. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, quoting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا ذُكِرْتُ ذُكِرْتَ مَعِي That whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned. Whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned. Imam Suyuti says, بِأَنْ تُذْكَرَ مَعَ ذِكْرِ فِي الْأَبَانِ وَالْإِقَامَ وَالْتَشَهُدْ وَالْخُطْبَةِ وَغَيْرِهَا That you are mentioned with me in the aban, the iqama for prayer, the tashahud in the prayer, whenever a khatib gives a khutbah, you are mentioned in other things as well. جَعَلَ إِسْمُهُ مَقْرُونًا بِإِسْمِ اللَّهِ Allah made his name next to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the meanings of وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَ And again, here we have the same type of uh, construction as أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَ وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ Again, لَا مُتَعْلِيلْ That's brought forward, right? Exclusively for you. 
in a way that's special for you. And then we have a delay again. We have a delay of the direct object. So again, it creates this shawq, this tashwiq, this hunger, this anticipation. What did he raise? What fa'ana laka dhikra, your name, your mention. Okay. And there's many things that many uh, of the say about this ayah. Uh, it's the most popular name in the world, the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Muhammad is the most popular name in the world. Fakhradin al-Razi says, Ismuhu maktuban ala al-arsh. The name of the Prophet Sallallahu is uh, written upon the throne, the divine throne of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. The name of the Prophet Sallallahu is there. Imam al-Baytawi, he mentions something. He says, this means the obedience of Allah is the same as the Prophet's obedience. His obedience, with the capital H, is the same as his obedience, the lowercase h. The obedience is the same. And Imam al-Zamakhshari, uh, uh, he also mentions this as well. And this is based on ayat in the Quran. May yuti'ar rasoola faqad Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger, obeys Allah. Right? Whoever obeys the messenger, obeys Allah. Man ata'ani faqad Allah. The Prophet وسلم, said, uh, kama qala, he said, whoever obeys me, obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Qurtubi uh, mentions the verse in the Quran, Wallahu rasuluhu ahaqu and yurduhu. Allah and his messenger, it is more befitting that you please him. Who? Right? It doesn't say huma, it's singular. And Imam Qurtubi says here, the singular pronoun is used to demonstrate a very personal relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Surah Tawbah, ayah number 62. Wallahu wa rasuluhu. Allah and his messenger. Uh, it is more fitting that you please him, not them. Him, singular. Because obedience to the messenger is the same as obedience to Allah. You cannot obey Allah and disobey the messenger, nor vice versa. It's the same obedience. This is one of the meanings of Qurafa'ana. Imam Qurtubi also mentions all of the prophets knew about him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of the prophets, he's mentioned in all of the books of the prophets. And this is something that, um, if you want to take my comparative religion class, we talk about a lot. And then, uh, also, he mentions, he's called in the Quran by al-qab, by titles. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Prophet by his title. Very rarely does Allah mention the first name of the Prophet in the Quran, and never does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly address him by his first name. But above all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses the Prophet based on the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says blessings of peace upon the Prophet and the angels as well. So it's not only the quantity, but the quality of the dhikr. Literally, the name, the dhikr of the Prophet is elevated because 24-7 somebody's making adhan. Somebody's making iqam, right? But that aside, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels are pronouncing blessings of peace upon the Prophet Okay, so this ends the first part here, the four rhetorical questions which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is using this rhetorical device to remind the Prophet of blessings from the past. This fat is called fat tafsiriya, meaning therefore, based on what I just said, therefore, inna ma'al usri yusran. With the rusul, what is an rusul? It is a hardship. Therefore, you should know this is really a promise. This is a why, a promise. Because what's going on at the time of this surah, there's a lot of hardship. And the Prophet and the Sahaba, they know the hardship that's happening, obviously. So there's an alif lam here, right? There's a definite article. In the ma'a al usri al. This al means that, that it's ahdiya, according to the Mufassirin. Meaning that they know what it's referring to. There's a reference that's known. What is this hardship that Allah is talking about? The Prophet knows what it is, and so do the Sahaba. It's very clear, right? So, with this particular person, there's a yusran, 
There is a in an ease. And this ease, this word, does not have an alif lam. There's no definite article. Which is this is a falling. There's a wow at the last ayah. Right? One of my teachers, Imam Suhaidi, explained it. If you ever listen, if you ever watch a boxing match, they introduce the fighter. He says, in this corner, uh, the Italian stallion, undefeated, undefeated. There's no and, undefeated, and, un why? Because it creates energy, excitement. It emphasizes it, right? That's what's, wallahu alam, this is what's going on here. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, it's just straight inna, how for toki. But why is it mentioned twice? The ulama say, one is for this life, one yusuf is for this life, and the next yusuf is for the next life. There's an ease in this life, and there's going to be an ease in the next life. Others say, the first yusuf is for the past, the next one is for the future. And some of them say, this is interesting, they say that there's tawqid lafdi, there's an uh, uh, emphasis that's um, lafdi, meaning it's pronounced. In other words, he's repeating the same thing twice, almost verbatim, out of comfort for the Prophet So for example, um, your child gets hurt. You say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You keep repeating it, it's okay, it's okay. Why do you do that? Right? It's for comfort, right? So this is, Wallah ba'an, so the ulama mentioned this as well, why this is mentioned. Or say, I promise, I promise. Are you going to do this? I promise, I promise. You mention it twice, right? Tawqid lafdi, this is called tawqid lafdi, when you actually repeat something over again. The same words. That's verses five and six. So that takes us to the end, seven and eight. Now we have two commands. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, فَإِذَا فَرَقْتَ فَنْصَرْ So, therefore, when you are free, right? فَرَقْتَ means you're, you have free time, you're done with something. فَنْصَرْ This verse, نَصَرَ means to stand or to peg something. To peg something, right? Um, to establish something. So the Urnama say here, this means that when you're free from your da'wah during the day, then peg yourself at night. What does that mean? Peg yourself. That means pray at night. Make yourself like a peg. Right? And pray at night. As the Prophet said, his greatest uh, pleasure is the prayer. So you can imagine during the day, he's dealing with kuffar, with these jahileen making fun of him, and he's probably thinking, I wish it was night so I can go be with my Lord and pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, but you have know, you know, work to do. During the day, when you're free from that, then fun song, then peg yourself, then stand yourself up and pray. Qiyamul Layl. Qiyam was his refueling, sallallahu alayhi wa For us, our refueling is doing God knows what. Right? And even unwind by doing X, Y, and Z. His unwinding, his refueling was the actual prayer. This is where he gets his strength from. So, Part of the meaning is that your job is never done, you must keep going, right? So one of my teachers said one time they were studying something, and then they stopped, they took a break, the teacher walked in and said, When you're free, do something else. In other words, do something else. Don't just relax. Now start writing it. Now do some, make a victim. Do something. Don't just relax and do nothing, right? The Prophet would never do nothing. He's always doing something, even if he's thinking, contemplating, right? Again, nasaba, the verb, is transitive, which means what? It needs a direct object. But if you notice here, there's no direct object. When you're free, then labor or do or pay or however you want to translate that. Do something. Do what? Do. Right? There's no lefrubi. This is called a tawassur fil ma'ana. Expansion of the meaning. Quite common in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will leave off the direct object. He'll leave off the mafribihi. Right? In order to 
get the listener to think about what it might be, or in order for the listener to fill in the blank. Right? Whatever it is that's virtuous, you can fill it in and do that. So what sort of ma'na, expansion of the meaning? And in verse 8, And to your Lord uh, be lovingly devoted. So, رَغِبَ, right, to ask, to desire, to wish, to long, with hope. Imam Sayyuti says that this means تَدَرُّ, to beg, to implore, to supplicate deeply. So they say here, فَإِذَا فَرَقْتَ فَنْصَرْ when you're done with your da'wah during the day, peg yourself and pray, and then when you're done with that, turn in supplication. Make du'a. You have to work, make da'wah, then you pray, then you make du'a. Work, da'wah, du'a. Work, da'wah, du'a. This is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. And in another qira'ah, it says, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْهِبْ Another way of reading the ayah which would make it causative. In that case it means, and towards your Lord, give others hope. Or, and towards your Lord, command them to make dua. Okay. So there's a, there's a difference in reading here. Both meanings are sound. And we're out of time. Any uh, questions or comments? I know I went very quickly. Hopefully that was coherent. You guys get anything? <laughs> um, I was wondering, so you said these words are um, they're like for constructing stories. Uh huh. Okay, so I was wondering, when you were talking about like the extension of the chest, so I know when you're like really sad and you're like crying or when you're tormented, you can feel like your chest is kind of like broken. Yes. So is it also kind of related to that? Then that what do you gain more knowledge about the meaning of life? Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the, the ulama do mention that, that the Prophet said that also Musa said that, because he was sort of unsure what his mission entailed, right? In the Torah, he totally tried to, tries to get out of it, right? The, the Torah version of that story. So, you know, pick somebody else, I'm this and I'm that. No, I can't, no, I can't, I can't do this. And it's like this long argument he has, right? That's in the Torah. Uh, but in the story in the Quran, Alam Rabbi Shahi Sadri is because he wanted more man, more meanings as to what his mission entailed, because that would console his heart. Because he saw it as something so difficult, he felt constriction in his heart. So when you have more meanings, right, then you can feel your heart ease, it, it, it uh, expands, so to speak. I don't know if you mentioned that, that knowledge, right? The, the sign of a heart that's uh, mashroor is one that is, is a person who has knowledge of deen. The sign of a heart that's been expanded is someone who has ilm. Knowledge will expand the heart. That's why in the Quran, Rabbi Zidni ilma, right? Rabbi Zidni ilma. Everyone should know the dua. It's very, very short, it's a beautiful dua, and you can make it plural. How do you say what these in the end about for them? From the Zidna in the good. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. The best to are from the bottom. People are going through depression, they feel tightness or constriction in their heart, you know. A lot of times they, they leave the Quran, they leave learning because they think, well, I, I, don't, I don't feel up to it. So they go do something like they eat or something, right? They go watch soap operas, something like that. No, the remedy for that is the Quran. Because the Quran says itself, this is a shifa. This is a shifa. This is a, a healing for whatever is in the heart, in the sudur. So you want your sadr to be expanded, go back to the Quran. And you feel better, you'll see it. You feeling depressed? Just read a surah from the Quran, read a translation, you can feel, feel much better. It works. Mm -hmm.